sponsored by CuriosityStream. We make a lot of mistakes in this business, a lot of mistakes. One of the biggest is forgetting just who exactly it is we review things for. The vast majority of you aren't buying new phones every year, much less every few months. You're not jumping from review unit to review unit every few weeks. You're living with what you spent your hard earned cash on for years and years. You care about how it compares to the two or three or more year old phone currently in your pocket maybe, and other options currently on the market, a little, but the cost of switching is high. So what you mostly want to know is, will you be getting what you pay for? If you'll be getting value for your money now and over the next two or three or more years, you'll be using it. We forget that. We throw up spec lists without any context and spend more time on flashy new features than overall experience and reliability. So I want to try and fix that. Hit subscribe and swanton bomb that bell dingus so you don't miss any of the other reviews and re-reviews that are coming up. And then buckle up. I'm Rene Ritchie. I've been using the iPhone XS since Apple introduced it back in September of 2018, some seven months ago. And this is Vector. In my three week later review, I said that the iPhone XS Max was Max in every sense of the word, that it wasn't a replacement for the then still not, but now thankfully updated 7.9 inch iPad mini and its four x three aspect ratio multi-window apps. But that thanks to its 6.5 inch edge to edge display, it still felt a lot like a tiny tablet. Having used the plus sized iPhones almost exclusively from six to 6S to seven, even eight on and off, thanks to there being no first gen 10 Max, I figured big would go back to being my go-to, but it really hasn't. The display is just big enough to make it less convenient than the non-Max without having either the old plus benefits like landscape home screen or iPad mini style multi-window apps stacked in portrait or side-by-side -side in landscape. And since the non-Max is now 5.8 inches, I find it more than big enough for all the normal iPhone things, especially now that there's a smart battery case for all the 10 class iPhones. I get extra, extra long battery life when I need it. Like when I'm traveling and I'm being tormented by poor signal and poorly tuned international carriers on roaming, or yeah, out in a multi hour long Pokemon Go event. And the rest of the time I get a light slim phone that's easy to pocket, easy to hold, easy to shoot with, also for multiple hours a day. It's the best of both worlds and so much so, I hope Apple builds a version with better lenses, bigger speakers, stands, and other options in the future. It would be the modular phone finally done right. With the iPhone XS, Apple integrated the new multi-core neural engine into the image signal processor of the A12 Bionic chipset, which lets them do a lot of heavy pixel pushing like smart HDR for stills and extended dynamic range for up to 4K 30 frames per second video. The biggest compliment I can give either of those features is that I turned them on, left them on, and don't even think about them anymore. There was an issue during the first few weeks when Smart HDR was misfiring on the selfie cam and making most of us look far too smooth and far too rosy, but Apple fixed that early on in an update. I said in my three week later review, my criteria for judging any camera attached to a phone or not is whether it lets me get photos I simply never could before, like the iPhone 7 Plus optically in low light and computationally with portrait mode. Both have gotten progressively better since. iPhone XS still doesn't have anything like the post-processing Google or Huawei are using to deliver night as daylight shots or the zoom or the ultra wide lenses. And that's hugely important. So I hope they're working on it and we get all of it soon. But Smart HDR has gotten really good, almost too good at resolving details in both shadow and light. And depth effect not only looks beautiful with its virtual lens models, but you can use it to bokeh out a child. What kind of person bokeh a child? Not that I would ever do that. But more recently, I've added another criteria for judging cameras, reliability. I was at CES with my friends and colleagues from Android Central, and they were complaining about their Pixel 3 cameras, simply not launching when they needed it to and forcing them to miss shots they really needed. The performance issues, including even in the camera app itself, have stuck with the Pixel from last year. I came to learn later it also had a problem actually saving photos and frames in video. Some Pixel owners are saying that the 3 and XL sometimes forget to save photos. And even when Google pushed out an update, it only made it fail less often, which ended up being absolutely unacceptable to them and to other high profile reviewers. That's something as someone who primarily shoots with iPhone, including almost all the B-roll for almost all the videos on this channel, I simply never have to worry about.
Apple has gone so far as to build a custom storage controller into their custom silicon to make sure every burst, every frame gets saved every time. As a user, it's not something I really think about. It's not something I should have to think about. I don't even realize it's there except through the reliability and trust we've developed for the camera. I get that it's not as flashy as a periscope lens or night sight algorithms, and those are mind-blowingly cool and super useful, and I totally want them all as well. But not all innovations are neon, and we have to stop pretending otherwise. Some are the systems that keep the neon from flickering so damn annoyingly we turn it off, and we have to start recognizing that as well. When it comes to the full imaging pipeline, from wide gamut capture, to color science, to color management, to ensuring it's all saved, to wide gamut displays that are individually calibrated at the factory, to easy sharing, from high dynamic range stills to extended dynamic range stereo video, even though other cameras have single elements or attributes that I envy, no one else is coming close in terms of the total package. And when I'm out shooting burst mode action or family portraits or friends special occasions or capturing that tasty B-roll or just, yeah, living my life, that consistency, that dependability is what really matters to me. I don't usually have a case on my iPhone. I test some sometimes and now I use the battery case when I travel, but most of the time I use my iPhone the way nature and Johnny Ive intended. I also don't baby it or any of my tech. It's not just that I'm a fan of the Star Wars worn aesthetic, though I am, but that this stuff is supposed to save time and serve me, not take time being served by me. So it'll get thrown in pockets with keys, fall off tables, and generally get knocked around a fair bit. So how has the iPhone XS fared? Really well, and better than the iPhone X. That shouldn't be a surprise since it's got even stronger, better balanced glass, but it still is. It's proven remarkably resistant to scratches and scuffs, especially on the back. I do have a few on the front, none that I notice when actually using it, but I can see them when I hold my phone up in just the right light. Otherwise, it's as rock solid as the day I got it, which when you combine that glass with that stainless steel band is about as solid a phone as I've ever felt. That's probably why it maintains such a good resale value. A flawless entry-level 64 gigabyte XS will get you over $500, 10s Max over $600 from a popular trading company, more if you sell it yourself. Same service, 128 gigabyte Note 9, which is same era, higher capacity, doesn't quite get you $350. 128 gigabyte Galaxy S10, which is six months newer and higher capacity, won't even get you $450. 128 gigabyte Pixel 3, same era, higher capacity, gets you $365. Pixel 3 XL, weirdly, just under that at $361. As reviewers, we don't often talk about things like how well a phone retains its value, but it's incredibly important to people who need to sell their current phone in order to afford their next phone. It's almost the equal and opposite aspect to the free education and training Apple provides at retail. A family friend recently bought a Samsung phone because the carrier offered her a great deal. She was completely new to smartphones and didn't know where to start with it. I pointed her to Android Central, of course, but she knew my mom had gone to the Apple store for a bunch of classes and wanted to know if she could do something similar. All I could do was point her back to the same carrier kiosk and lead us to say they were spectacularly less than helpful. This is one of my biggest complaints about modern phones, as the companies that make them get more and more aggressive on features and less restrained on pricing, they need to do a much better job justifying those prices and explaining everything we get for our money. Just like the eco-friendly slides they throw up on stage, I wanna see the total value prop slide so I know just exactly what every company is offering me for just exactly every dollar I'm paying. There's a faster secure enclave on the iPhone XS that should make Face ID faster, but I can't say that I've noticed because it's always been ridiculously fast. There are some occasions, like when my phone is on the table or charger or whatever, that I still miss Touch ID, but the vast majority of the time, Face ID is so much less obtrusive, it still feels, if not transparent, then certainly translucent. Because it's Apple, it's also been tested and beaten up on by the biggest papers and networks of record and every YouTuber in tech. Face ID was more expensive. It did not think it looked like me. Moment of truth. Still locked. In an age where Samsung's brand new face scanner is being fooled by photos and video. There you go. Did you get that, Jack? Okay, look, I'm gonna spin this around real time, a video of my face, and the phone is now unlocked. And their ultrasonic fingerprint sensors by 3D printers. That's the kind of reassurance of review that no company can buy. Though, as consumers, I sincerely think we should absolutely insist that this gets done for each and every phone, especially the flagships. It's a huge advantage to Apple customers that this stuff gets the highest scrutiny in the industry, and that makes it a huge disadvantage to the customer of every other vendor.
Not that Apple's been perfect with security either. There have been some issues on the Mac and the FaceTime group call bug bit iPhone as well and hard, which is why I think Apple needs to do for security this year what it did for performance last year. Dedicate time and resources to go back and nail everything down from the base level frameworks on up. Privacy has also remained a top priority for Apple, even up to and including all the entertainment pre-announcements from last month. That might not sound very important, but given how many entertainment services and how many games are tracking not only our behavior, but our location, it's critical. There are still some areas I'd like to see Apple address, like Google being the default search instead of an option alongside DuckDuckGo in Setup Buddy. If you want to use Facebook or Google or Amazon or any of their services, as a grown ass adult, you can totally do that. But if you don't want to, you can use Apple or Microsoft or indie services on your iPhone without having to log your entire phone into Google to begin with. And if you, like me, have to use Google for work, you can stay logged out of all the services you don't absolutely need to be logged into, which is admittedly the best of the worst. Just about a month ago, Apple released the second generation AirPods. I've already posted a hands-on and a 10 day later review, link, you guessed it, in the description, but how they work with the iPhone XS deserves a follow-up. Thanks to the new H2 chip, pairing and switching is faster than ever, where previously moving between the Mac and the iPhone, which was my most common scenario, could take up to several taps and long, long seconds. Now it's almost always instant. Having HS on the AirPods is also great. Yes, even when already having it on your phone, because you don't have to stay with your phone. It can be in your pocket or bag on the charger or in the glove compartment, and you can still get a lot of things done. Just not everything though. Now that AirPods make so much almost transparent, the opacities that remain are super apparent. More specifically, anything that requires authentication, like unlocking doors or even just checking messages, doesn't really work. Because what's the point of having HS on the AirPods when they answer back, you'll need to unlock your iPhone first. Maybe Apple can figure out something there, at least until they get a heart rate sensor right up into the AirPods. Meanwhile, the sound is the same for music, podcast, video, and everything else. The mic is even better for calls, so is the battery life. And the latency is so much better, I haven't reached for wired headphones since I got them, not for anything, including CuriosityStream. It's the world's first streaming service to address our collective lifelong quest to learn, explore, and understand. Founded by John Hendricks of Discovery Channel fame, with over 2,400 titles available worldwide and on pretty much any platform you can imagine, including iOS and the iPhone. Check out the original series, Speed. It's investigating mankind's insatiable necessity to move faster and further, for pleasure, for work, to explore, to survive. It's like the A12 Bionic, just for humans. Go to curiositystream.com slash vector and enter the promo code vector to kickstart your membership completely free for the first 30 days. Thanks CuriosityStream and thanks to all of you for supporting the show. Over the last seven months, I've come to realize something about the iPhone XS. It's not just the experience that keeps me coming back, although I deeply appreciate how consistent and considerate that remains. It's the reliability, the trust, not just during the first week or two when I'm doing my review, but throughout the year when I typically keep using the phone and the years that follow when I give them to family members to keep on using. My sister currently has my 6S Plus and my mom has my 7 Plus. They've been using them day in, day out, all day, every day since they got them for years and they're still looking and working great, especially with the performance improvements in iOS 12. It's why everyone from pro photographers to survivalists trust the iPhone to keep everything from their photos to themselves safe. I've bought most Google phones most years, starting with the Nexus One, which I loved. I have a Huawei phone. I might even get one of the current Samsungs because my work affords me just that kind of luxury. But when it comes down to what really matters to me, year in, year out, the overall value of the iPhone is still really, really tough to beat. And that includes the iPhone XS. If you've had your phone for a while and you think you're ready to upgrade, but you're still not sure, and you just want to know seven months later, sales and promotions and whatever is tempting you, is the iPhone XS still worth getting? Is it worth being your next phone? Apple kept the same basic iPhone design for four generations, from the six to the eight. Since the XS is only the second iteration of the new modern design, I wouldn't expect any major changes again this year. Apple's also made it a point of competition, and yes, pride, to push out updates to every phone, on every carrier, in every region, all at the same time, all the time, for years. So what you get now should last you a good long time. Either way, my buying advice is always the same. If you can wait, wait as long as you can possibly wait because there'll always be something new around the corner. But if you need it or would benefit from getting it now, 
then get it now and have zero regrets because there'll always be something new around the corner. At least that's my opinion. I'd love to hear yours. Hit like, hit subscribe. It really helps out the channel. And then hit up the comments below and let me know. And thank you so much for watching.